to you here this morning. Everybody safely distanced. Great to see you here. We don't have any burning sunshine this morning, so it's going to be a very pleasant day as we worship the Lord together out here in the beautiful outdoors. A special welcome to each one of you that are here, as well as to each one that is watching us even as we speak live via the internet. Welcome to each one of you, Discovery family. Appreciate you being a part of our early worship service this morning. As per usual, uh, we'll be dismissing the children to Children's Church, we'll call it, this morning uh, once uh, we're done with our worship set. So we'll worship together as a family. And then when I stand up to share from God's Word, I'll dismiss the kids and they can go in that direction. I want to mention again this morning, as I did last week, that we've got a very special focus event coming up in just a couple of weeks that we would invite everybody to be a part of. It's going to be a citywide scavenger hunt event. Uh, it's going to be something that the kids are going to absolutely enjoy, and uh, we want to have as many people participate in as can. And so you can get more information about that either on the website or if you need instant gratification, you can get that information this morning, and you'll be able to access that at that tent over that way where you see uh, Marla and Audrey standing there. They can tell you exactly what this event is all about. They can get your children or your grandchildren registered for it. They can get you signed up as a participant and a volunteer. We really would like to see this become something that, uh, that, that just involves as many people in the body as possible. So we hope that you'll be a part of that as well. I want to invite you to stand along with the worship team this morning, uh, if you're comfortable doing that. And as we stand, I want to pray and just ask the Lord to precede us as we worship. And so this morning we do, Lord, uh, ask that you be very present here. We know that your spirit is resident within each one of us that know Jesus Christ by faith. But the word also tells us that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so as we've gathered, Lord, to lift our voices in unison and uh, join our hearts together, Father, we pray that you would receive our praises, that they would be an accurate reflection of what we genuinely believe to be true about your word and your revelation and, and your person. And so we ask, Father, that you'd be pleased with our words and the meditations of our heart this morning. Prepare us to do that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here. We're in the Father's house right here. All right.
Right, good singing, you. Our God is the God of overcoming the impossible things, amen? And so whatever barricades that we have in our hearts, whether it's pride or pain or struggling or shame, we can give that to him and he can fix it, he can redeem it, he can restore it. He's the healer. So we welcome him here in this corner of Fort Collins. We welcome him here in our church. Move through our hearts, move through this city, Jesus. You can use this time. Amen. That's our prayer.
your heart. Come and do the work, God. We welcome it. And I go near, I see his wounds, his hands, his sword, my Savior.
Yes, thank you indeed. And as I mentioned, um, children, it's time for you to take off. If you don't want to sit around and listen to boring old Pastor Rick for 30 minutes, you can go that away, and uh, they'll have a lively lesson for you over there. So help yourselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you to each one of you who are present here. Again, I appreciate so much your being a part of our outdoor worship service. There's an aspect of this, of course, that's fun and novel, and, uh, and I enjoy it in moderation. However, I am very much personally looking forward to getting back indoors once again, uh, a little more controlled environment, a little more options in terms of what we can do. Um, for your information, um, our renovations in terms of our video and audio systems is effectively done in the sanctuary. And so all that remains really is to bring up all the equipment from downstairs as we've got it scattered all over the facility in order to kind of shift it out here on Sunday morning, getting all that stage back into the sanctuary once again. And all that can happen within a day or so and we'll be good to go. In preparation of moving back indoors for worship, uh, we have had all of the carpeting throughout the building in all the rooms, sanctuary, uh, sanitized, steam cleaned. Uh, we are making preparations to get back indoors. The only rooms we have not done yet are this one right behind me here as well as the youth room upstairs. And all that will happen once we get the equipment out of those rooms. So uh, we're not sure exactly what it's going to, to look like. We're not sure exactly when it's going to be able to be happening. However, uh, more than likely what will happen will be some sort of a phased re-entry where uh, we can have a certain population in the sanctuary, maybe 150 or so people safely spaced, and then we'll have uh, overflow in the youth room as well as downstairs here in the Iwana room. We've run the wiring, I believe, for that already, have the equipment to do it. So we'll be able to accommodate everyone indoors for worship once again, certainly once the weather starts to turn a little more nasty, uh, but preparations are, are being made. If you've been with us here at Discovery, um, either in person or via the internet over these weeks where we've been uh, worshiping together here in July, then perhaps you'll remember that we've been focusing our attention a bit on the theme of freedom. Um, certainly in our nation, we have much to celebrate in terms of our national and individual freedoms that you and I enjoy like no other nation on the face of the planet. Um, and we have been pointing back to some of our founding documents as we've been talking, the Declaration of Independence from, of course, 1776, and the Constitution of the United States from 1787. And in particular, we have been remembering the First Amendment uh, to our Constitution, which dates back to 1791, which, uh, as I'm sure you'll remember, says the following, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, this morning, I'd like for us to give our thinking for just a few moments to uh, the very first sentence in that amendment. Those of you who are history buffs or careful students of American government will recognize that that first sentence contains two clauses. The first is what's called the Establishment Clause. You can see that, I hope, underlined on the screen. It prevents the federal government from creating or from establishing an official national church. And then secondly, there is what is called the Free Exercise Clause. Again, you see that underlined on the screen. It's a statement that guarantees a person's and specifically a citizen's right to hold whatever religious beliefs he or she wants to and to freely exercise that belief. Now, this is a deeply held and precious liberty that we as Americans enjoy. And probably most of you are aware that this is not simply something that our founding fathers just pulled out of their hats as they sat around in a room in Philadelphia drafting important documents. But these clauses that we've just read, in fact, date back to roots more than 170 years earlier in our nation's history. We all know about the Mayflower and how in 1620, 400 years ago this year, it arrived on the shores of our country, specifically Cape Cod, and on board that ship 
were 130 passengers, English expats, men, women, and children, who had all set sail from Holland, bound for the new land with one specific purpose in mind. It was not for the purpose of scientific discovery. It was not with the intention of establishing a new colony for the empire of Great Britain. It was not with the intention of discovering gold or the fountain of youth or for growing rich. The clearly expressed central purpose of the voyage of the Mayflower was to free people from the tyranny of the Church of England and provide free people the free exercise of their individual faith before Almighty God. It was about religious liberty and the freedom to worship God in spirit and in truth. That is where our nation began. Now, how far have we come over the past 400 years? We are free to exercise our faith. But what is it? And what difference does it make in our nation? And more importantly, more specifically, in my heart and in yours. As we prepare to pray and, and hear God's voice on this, um, I want to remind you of some somewhat modern prophetic words from the singer-songwriter Scott Wesley Brown. Perhaps some of you remember him. He wrote and he said, and half the world is starving while a banner of decency is torn, debating over disarmament, killing children before they're born, and fools who march to win the right to justify their sin. Every nation that has fallen has fallen from within. Would you pray with me as we prepare to think about God's words? And so, Lord, we want to do that this morning. There is nothing more important that we can give our thinking to, nothing that speaks more specifically to our hearts and to our needs than what it is that you have preserved for us in your revelation, the Holy Scriptures. And so this morning, Father, as we think your thoughts, we pray that we would bring ours into alignment with that, and not just our thinking, but our, our living, our choosing as well. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'd like for us to get practical this morning. Uh, theory is good, but sometimes theory can get a little bit divorced from reality. So I'd like us to think today about what is real. If you brought your Bibles with you this morning, I want, you, uh, I want to invite you to find the book of James in the New Testament. The scripture, uh, when it's appropriate, will be on the screen eventually, uh, but you can find this on your Bible app as well. But as we begin this morning, I'd like to share with you, by way of preface, a now famous experiment that was conducted almost 50 years ago. In 1973, two social psychologists at Princeton University wanted to examine whether thinking religious thoughts would have any practical effect on helping people. In other words, does proximity to and being familiar with spiritual sorts of things necessarily make a difference in people's personal behavior. In particular, the story that Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke chapter 10, we call it the parable of the Good Samaritan, was going to be the basis for their experiment. It's a familiar story. It's one of those uh, strange and challenging narratives because in that story, Jesus reveals the twist that it's not the religious people, a priest, or maybe you could insert pastor, and it wasn't the Levite, or maybe there you could insert elder or deacons, who stopped to help the man who was in dire needs, who was in trouble in that story. Instead, as Jesus tells it, they purposely passed by on the other side of the path in order to avoid engagement with the man in need. Those Princeton psychologists 
were interested to find out what difference that story might make in people's behavior. And they also wondered what effect it might have if someone was preoccupied or busy or being in a hurry. What effect might that have on people's values and on their specific choices in their real world? They speculated that maybe those two religious guys in the Bible story, maybe they were late for a temple service or something like that. While the Samaritan, who actually stopped and helped, had no such rush going on in his life, maybe that's what made the difference. So the psychologists set up an experiment for seminarians, that is, guys who are in graduate school training for full-time pastoral or full-time Christian ministry. Princeton Seminary was once known for producing the finest minds and thinkers in the Christian church. You might call it Princeton uh, Cemetery today, but back in the day, it had quite a reputation. These psychologists split their seminary students into two large groups who would all be sat down and asked to prepare a three to five minute talk that they would deliver to a live audience about an hour from then. Half of these students were asked to prepare a talk specifically on what sort of jobs, what sort of responsibilities, what sort of duties they thought that full-time pastoral ministers might do on a daily basis. The other half of the students were given the same assignment, but they were also given the story of the Good Samaritan to read first, and they were told that they had to incorporate that scripture story somehow into their talk. The idea was to get people specifically thinking about issues related to God and helping to minister to people. The idea being, wouldn't that sort of thinking make them more likely to help someone if they specifically saw someone in need? So, after the students had worked on their talks for a little while, a graduate student would then come into the room and then give them a map pointing them to a building across the campus. Sometimes, this graduate assistant would say, it's going to be a little while yet before they're ready for you over there, but you might as well head on over and just wait. In other words, there's no rush. You can take your time. To the other group, after they had worked on their assignment, the assistant would come in and he would say, you need to go over to this location immediately. They, in fact, were expecting you a few minutes ago. In other words, get up and hurry up. Now, what all of those students did not know was that along the way, across the campus, the researchers had staged a fake incident. An actor was sitting slumped, or he was lying on the path that they would be walking on. His head was down, his eyes were closed, he was not moving. He could be heard moaning or coughing or mumbling. It clearly looked like this was somebody who needed some help. And then each time, one of those study participants would pass by the victim, an observer would rate the participant's response to the needy person using a scale of from one to six. Number one, being the lowest score that a person could get, meaning that they completely failed even to notice the victim in need at all. A little bit higher on the scale equated to noticing, and then higher still to stopping and looking intently, or a little higher yet, asking the victim if they needed some assistance or help. Five points would be engaging the victim and calling for help. Six points, the highest score equaled after stopping, refusing then to leave the victim alone or insisting on being able to help them themselves. Now, the overall results clearly revealed two things. First of all, hurry definitely affected helpfulness negatively. The ministry students who were in a rush were much less likely to stop and less helpful towards the man who was in need compared to those who were in no hurry to get themselves over to the other building. Almost unanimously, 
people concerned about being late to their appointment either didn't notice the need or they simply failed to help. So that was one outcome. But remember, the other factor in the experiment was thinking about the Bible story and the religious virtue of helping others. How much did that matter? What do you think? Well, it didn't matter at all. The Bible students on their way to give a talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan were no more likely to give help than students who were going to give basically an unrelated talk. So, the psychologists reported, quote, even though we might expect that this should have made a difference, there was no evidence of any difference in practical helpfulness between the two. In fact, the researchers further noted, on several occasions, seminary students going to give a talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan literally stepped over the victim on their way. So, this brings us to the book of James this morning and the freedom that you and I have to exercise our faith. And for those of you who are familiar with the book of James, you'll remember that as an author, he is a pretty straight shooter. He pulls no punches. For instance, in chapter 1, we are told, verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The message, the paraphrased version, expands on that a bit by putting it this way. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you're anything but. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other, act on what you hear. Now, most scholars agree that the epistle of James is the most Jewish book in the New Testament, followed closely by the book of Hebrews. But both were written to a Jewish audience or Jewish converts to Christianity. And so that statement in verse 22 highlights a bit of a clash of cultures. What I mean is the difference between Hebrew thinking on the one hand and Greek sort of thinking on the other. The author, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is a Jew writing to Jewish Christ followers, now scattering across the world, ruled by Romans with a Greek and a Western sort of a mindset like ours. Here in the 21st century West, our philosophy is shaped by thinkers like Plato and Aristotle much more than by Jesus and the Bible. So, that's why if we want to honor God and follow God, it's critical for us to have our minds renewed by the Word and by the Spirit in order for us to think and to act biblically. So, why would James write there, don't just listen, do? Well, the Greek word translated listen in English means to, uh, to take notice to a sound. The Hebrew word for listen, you know it, is shema. It's a very important word, very important concept for the Jews. Every single day, they would pray from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, Hear, Shema, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Shema is interpreted or translated in the Greek as listen or hear, and it means that, but really it means so much more than that. For the Hebrews, it meant to pay full attention to as if your life depended on it. It carries with it the idea of immediately working to incorporate what it is you've heard into your living, adapting every aspect of your thought life, your speech and conduct to what you have heard, even memorizing it and teaching it to your kids as you walk through life, living it out in the world around you. This was a very encompassing idea. Now. Our Western culture, influenced by the Greeks, and Eastern culture, influenced by the Hebrews, are very different. Again, let me give you some practical examples. Number one, for the Greeks, sight was the most important of the five senses that human beings have. For Hebrews, hearing 
was the most important. The Greeks valued the accumulating of knowledge and the pursuing of philosophical thought. The Hebrews, rather, valued wisdom, that is, knowledge applied in practical living. Western thought, our thought, tends to want to break things down into components and steps in order to figure it out. Hebrew thought wants to see things brought all together to live it out. Greek thought divides and dissects everything into categories. It's either or for them. Hebrew thought, thought rather, brings it all together. It's both and for the Orientals. The Greek ideal is an individual's achievement and winning in competition. Back in the day, the ancient Olympics were primarily individual games and events. The Hebrew ideal is community, conquering through cooperation. Greek and he Hebrew, excuse me, Greek and Western thought means that you and I are more important because of what belongs to us or what degrees we might have or what we have uh, achieved in terms of recognition. Hebrew thinking says you are more important because you belong. You are in a family. You are a part of a community. The Greek world tends to split up the natural from the supernatural, the divine from the secular. The Hebrew worldview says that everything is sacred. Everything is supernatural. For the Greeks, truth is something you discover that you uncover by human reason, by scientific investigation from, from the bottom up. For the Hebrews, God is the source of truth, and you discover him by revelation from the top down. Greek thinking says, I'll know it when I understand it. Hebrew thinking says, I know it because I do it. So you see, there's a world of difference. Now, let me point you to another scripture for our consideration that I think further highlights this. You'll find it, again, in the book of James, chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. There, James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you then says to them, Go in peace, Keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So here you see another example. To the Hebrew mind, you can't have God talk without God walk. Biblical truths coming out of your lips, but not demonstrated in your living. The two are actually one. Now, this was at the very heart of our Lord's teaching as well. If you remember, when Jesus was engaging with a bunch of religious Pharisees in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, and one of those fellows was trying to trip him up, and so he asked Jesus, what was the greatest commandment? And you'll remember, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So here, Jesus reiterates the Shema of Deuteronomy 6. And then, even though he wasn't asked the question, and so Jesus, what would you say would be number two then? Jesus went on immediately to say this in verse 39. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, you really can't do the first without doing the second. In fact, doing the second verifies or proves the first. So back to the second chapter of James once again. In verse 18, he says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good, but. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So here, James is talking about someone who might say, well, I don't need to do any works because I am saved by faith. I prayed the prayer. 
I believe in God, I have the fire insurance policy. And James says, really? So you have knowledge about a concept in your head, and you want to call faith something that doesn't change how you live? It's just something that you subscribe to? What kind of fake faith is that? That kind, even the demons have. They believe that God is real. They know all about that. What good does just knowing do? Now, as you read that, it's important for us to understand clearly what James is saying here. Because a lot of people don't. They miss it. The great reformer, Martin Luther, didn't get it. Luther flipped out about the book of James, famously calling it an epistle of straw because he thought that James was clearly teaching salvation by works. But he isn't. He's teaching that both faith and works work together hand in hand. He's not saying if you do good deeds, then you'll be saved. He's actually going the other way. And he's saying, if you've been saved, then you'll do good works. Because faith without works won't work. It's dead faith. It's fake. So how can you know if you have a living faith? And not just some head knowledge or some kind of a mental assent or subscription to a code of conduct or to a set of theological propositions. Well... There's another scripture that I'd like to point us to um, for a clear answer to that question. It's found in the book of 2 Corinthians and chapter 13. There, the Apostle Paul in verse 5 said this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. What's an exam? An exam is a test. So what's the test? What is the true test of faith? Jesus gives it to us in John 13, 35, where he said, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And you know who else picked up on that idea? It was James, his half-brother, who also says, Faith is proved by how you love your brothers and sisters. And who are our brothers and sisters? James writes about brothers, Adelphoi, 15 times in his epistle, and every time that he does, he's talking about the church, God's family. Look at what Jesus said about family in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verses 46 through 50. I won't read that passage. You can see it on the screen for the sake of time here this morning, but if you skip down to verse 50, you see there it says, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus redefines for us who we should consider to be a part of our family because belonging in family, again, remember, was critical to the Hebrews. And so in his epistle, James says that you show you belong to Jesus when as a part of his family, you care for the other members of your family, especially the ones in need. Because only faith that works, works. Anything else is just pretend and fake. And then to drive home that point, James gives us an illustration of living, working faith. He points us back to the father of the faith, Father Abraham. You remember the story from the early pages of the book of Genesis, chapters 15 and following, remember? Abraham has prayed, Abraham has hoped, he's waited all his life for a son. When he is 100 years of age, little Isaac is born, finally. And then a few years on from that, God tests his faith. In Genesis 22, remember, Abraham is told by God, take your son, your only son, who you love, and sacrifice him to me on the mountain. Now, at that juncture, Abraham had a decision to make. He would need to either act on his faith or not. In this case, faith needed to put some hiking sandals on and go up the mountain with his son. 
You'll remember the story. Halfway up, young Isaac looks at his dad, and he says, hey, hey, pops, we got the wood, and I see you got a great big old knife there, but where's the sacrifice? Then Abraham looks at him, and he says this, God will provide himself. Faith says God will provide. God will make a way. Even when I have no idea what God is up to or what God is going to do. Now, again, Martin Luther didn't like James's take on that. And he called that blind faith because you cannot see, you cannot understand how it could possibly be. The theologian Soren Kierkegaard famously called it the leap of faith, like someone jumping off of a cliff without certainty about how or where they might land. But you know what? Both of those men were wrong. This was neither blind faith, nor was this a leap in the dark. In that moment, Abraham was trusting the God that he knew, and it was a very reasonable decision that he made. He'd seen so many times that God had been his provider, that God had walked with him, that God had talked with him. The birth and provision of, of the baby Isaac himself was a miracle provision from God. So, Abraham, in that moment, made a real-time decision to hang on to what he knew. He knew who God was and who God is and what God was capable of. And so, for Abraham, it was not a leap in the dark, but a step into the light, into the light of who he knew his God to be. And all the time that Abraham was walking up one side of the mountain, God was sending a sacrificial ram up the other side, the side of the mountain that Abraham could not yet see from where he was. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 17, says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham, see it, reasoned that God could even raise the dead. That's what faith is. It's reasonable. So it does something that says, God, I trust you. The God who can raise the dead can do anything. And so trusting him is faith that works. In these pandemic days, it's easy, I think, to become self-absorbed and isolated. Some of that is for personal safety, for sure. But our lives, and particularly our spiritual lives, need to be about more than just playing it safe and just, and just holding on to our faith without deploying it somehow. Here's five column checkpoints that I'd like to, uh, to leave us with this morning to sort of help evaluate the health of your faith and mine, sort of like a checkup. Is it living and active, or has it grown lethargic and satisfied in my life with just kind of going through the motions? So let me ask you to ask yourself these questions. Number one, how do you feel about worship? Really, is it something in your life that is a priority to you? Or has it become more, say, of a ritual that you just go through because you know that you should? Is it a daily discipline, not just Sunday, but a daily discipline that you cultivate? Each weekday morning, I get up at 4 a.m. and I spend the first 45 minutes or so lifting some weights and, and doing some resistance training. You can't tell, I know, because I'm wrinkled on the outside, but inside I'm just as firm and taut as you can imagine. Um, now, I do that because I know that it's good for me, but frankly, I hate it, and um, I dread hearing that alarm go off each morning and having to trudge down to the basement or off to the gym for my daily dose of torture. Worship can become like that, a routine that we go through, a chore that we just need to do, stand up and sing the song, 
but sometimes that can just be faking it. Here's a second checkpoint. What kind of thoughts and goals do you have for your life? Now, obviously, we cannot know exactly what the immediate future holds given the uncertainty of our days, and that can make planning a little bit tough. I saw, I think, a, a sort of a funny meme this last week. It said, uh, it's safe to say that everyone in 2015 who was asked the interview question, where do you see yourself in five years, got it wrong. When you think about the things that you would like to do next year or the next five years, are you at the center or are other people and God in the middle? There's nothing wrong, certainly, with having personal goals, but where is love on your priority list? Are others a part of your plans and goals? Number three, how do you feel about giving? Your giving to the Lord, whether it's through a local church like this one or other ways that the Lord may lead you, really, it's always a thermometer of your spiritual faith and health. How do you view and how do you use and how you are sacrificially redistributing your resources that God has entrusted to you? All of that tells you, in part, how living and how active your personal faith is. Do you have an open heart and hands and pocketbook, or is it a painful and difficult experience for you to release your resources generously? Number four, how often do you study your Bible? Is it something that gets little regular attention in your life? Or are you actively pursuing a greater knowledge of God and His will for your living? You can't know that apart from His revelation, which is found in His Word, the Bible. And so it's important for, for everyone to, to read the Scriptures every day. And beyond just reading it, studying it, with intentionality and with diligence and with a heart that's open to application and to change. Finally, are you talking to God every day? Obviously, the basis of a lively relationship with another person is regular communication. If you want an intimate relationship, then communication is essential for trust and for security and for assurance. The very same is true with God. God has made a way. He invites you and I to boldly connect with Him whenever, wherever. A living faith connects to the living God in every aspect of our living. This morning, I want to invite you to stand as we prepare to be dismissed. This is our time of thinking about and continuing to worship in our giving. And as we are dismissed, there'll be a song that plays. And as you make your way, eventually, uh, from the green here over to the side, to the right or to the left, there's a little box there if you'd like to give physically in that way. Of course, you can continue to give. And many of you have been, and we're grateful, faithfully giving online. Certainly, that's available to you as well. Would you stand with me as we're dismissed in prayer? Father, thank you again for the time this morning to give our thinking to yours to your words, to your instruction for our living. Uh, only your Holy Spirit knows what he wants to do in our individual lives, but I pray that he would have the freedom to do that, we, that we would not uh, stymie him or grieve him or block him in any way, but that you would help our faith to be living and active and allow your words to make a difference in our living. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.